like the ability to respond to something that dynamic that quickly across that many degrees of freedom is a really, really, really hard challenge. This is why we don't have these currently is because doing what that thing just did is super yeah. hard. Um, these weren't just little moves at all. So the first one is this drop by Tesla and they're showing a daily walk of Optimus going, but this time instead of like a flat ground, cement ground streets, they're walking along a kind of a, I called it a forest, not a forest, but uh, it's a terrain. We'll watch that. Elon says Optimus can now walk on highly variable ground using neural nets to control its electric limbs. And he forgot to mention Optimus was doing this while blindfolded. So they purposely wanted to test this out where Optimus is not using its vision and they're just reacting to the kind of um, the balance based on onboard computers. Optimus robots are regularly cruising around our workplace in Palo Alto where vision is used for static and dynamic object avoidance. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, climbing up terrain. Boy, it sure, it's walking slowly, but it sure looks like it's walking like, like I would if I was going down a, a hill like this. Yeah, I mean, there are certain parts of the way that it walks that don't look necessarily human-like, but at the same time, it doesn't have the exact same structure as the human body. And so, you know, you can't make it really exactly the same appearance, um, but functionally, yeah, like, you know, uh, how many of us have been walking down a slope with mulch on it and slipped like that? You know, that's uh, really very common. And to see the robot actually be able to, you know, slip and recover and not lose its balance, not fall down, uh, that's a really good piece of data. Then they also talked about, you know, they're planning to try and help it be able to fall. And when it does actually lose its balance completely in a way that it doesn't damage itself, you know, try and have as much grace as possible and, you know, protecting itself using its arms and those kinds of things. They're on the way to doing that. But this is a great step forward. Um, the There's a couple of technical things that are really difficult about this and kind of new, at least new for Optimus, maybe not new completely, um, but one of those things is the fact that they're using actual neural net control of the walking and the balance. And that's not something that's typically done. Um, the, you know, I really don't know to what extent the Atlas robots by Boston Dynamics used neural nets in their, their movement. I don't think it's at all. I think that they're using a more classical approach, which uses what are called PID controllers. Uh, to manage the the control loop of all of that walking motion. And it's really, really hard to get those to work well. If you spend enough time, you can accomplish it, uh, but it's, it's not an easy solution. And being able to use a neural net to accomplish the same thing means that they can make progress on the, the balance and the walking and all of the, the movement of Optimus over time a lot more quickly than using a, a much more traditional approach. It's so, so human-like, isn't it though? Like we don't always see things. So you're not always looking around. And then if you just start falling, you need to have this immediate reaction. And they're using training, machine learning, all that data, onboard sensors to sense. It's really amazing when you slow it down. I've got some videos here where we have slow motion and you saw that they played it twice. So here, this case, they, they you saw that he slipped. And as soon as he did, look at that left arm, just like you would, and this is a slow motion. The left arm goes backwards to change your balance and it figured it out, right? It knew how to kind of try to recover from that. So that that was. Yeah. Cool. And that's not only the way that he, you know, twisted his body, but just, just even a simpler observation that the entire body from toe to finger, you know, head to toe, They're all moving left, right. Yeah every single actuator right here is involved in the recovery from that slip. That yeah. means that the control algorithm has 100% control of all of the, the degrees of freedom of the body. And that's how our, our yeah. bodies work. But the twist. Traditionally, yeah. that is not how classical robotics works. 
like the ability to respond to something that dynamic that quickly across that many degrees of freedom is a really, really, really hard challenge. This is why we don't have these currently is because doing what that thing just did is super yeah. hard. I love it. Yeah. So I wanted you to explain a little bit more what Milan Kovac said. He's the vice president of um, Optimus, the team that's building the bot. He said, Tesla's where real world AI is happening. So these runs are on mulched ground where I've myself slipped before. What's really crazy here is that for these, Optimus is actually blind, keeping its balance without video yet. Only other onboard sensors consumed by neural net running in two to three milliseconds on its embedded computer. Two to three milliseconds, right? So you can explain that a little bit more, the latency of how quickly it can like sense things as it's happening. Uh, more exciting work happening on adding vision so it can better plan ahead, making the gate look more natural on such rough terrain, making it more responsive to velocity and direction commands. I don't know what that means. Um, learning how to fall to minimize damage when unavoidable, stand back up, join us for this fascinating reinforcement learning, imitation learning, foundation nuts. Yeah, so the the thing that they're doing here by not using vision is they're really testing the sense of what's called proprioception, the ability of the neural net to understand what is the orientation of the body and like how are all the limbs in space in, like how much are they extended contracted are they at angles just like the physical location of every single component of the body and then the relationship of that to the environment and whether or not you can stay balanced and so you know it's taking in like its ability to sense hey like i'm this is what i expect my position to be in mm. then oh i don't it doesn't feel like what i expected is happening i need to make some adjustments and then adjusting every two to three milliseconds so that's like uh several hundred times a a second because i think yeah if it was one millisecond that would be one adjustment every or a thousand adjustments every second so if you do three then you're talking about 300 micro adjustments every second roughly um and so the ability to do that so fast helps it to maintain its balance because it can make those those fine adjustments over time. Um, but just think about how hard it would be to walk in any of those scenarios that you're seeing there without like it, you kind of look at it and you think, oh, man, you know, like, OK, he didn't fall down. That's somewhat impressive, but it doesn't look like, you know, if I was walking down that hill that I would look way better. You know, I wouldn't fall all that stuff. But now do that same thing with a blindfold on. How hard is that going to be? That's right. Now this is actually probably more impressive mm -hmm. than what it looks like at first glance. And yeah. so that's, that's important to notice. And then once they, so that means that, you know, they're, they're really just trying to isolate the variables or trying to solve um, this as well as they can without adding the vision. And then once they have the ability for it to see the world in front of it and then, um, incorporate what it's seeing into how it's planning to move then it'll just get that much better um and this is a really really good foundation and then if you can bring up the tweet we can talk about some of the other aspects of um what milan was talking about there so yeah making the gate look more natural on rough terrain this is just going to require doing more training on rough terrain compared to like a lot of the training so far has been done both probably real world and in simulation has mostly been done on smooth flat surfaces because they've been concentrating yeah. on getting it to work in their offices in their factories where you've got you know nice carpeted floor or concrete warehouse floor where everything is smooth and just doesn't have to worry about this so this is just a matter of okay let's start beefing up the the training data um and then making it more responsive to velocity and direction commands um i'm assuming this has to do there's there's two possibilities one of them is that it could be the high level overall command say hey i want you to go forward i want you to go backward i want you to go left i want you to go right maybe it's just whatever system they have for that is slow and it's taking longer for that command to actually work through the whole neural net or the other thing is it may be 
that they're still working on the control algorithms for each specific actuator, that it's taking the actuators themselves longer to respond because they don't have the, the software control loops for each of the actuators as tight as they would like it to be, which then makes your whole problem a lot harder. Like if you're sending a command to your actuator to you know, yeah. move by five degrees and it takes it, you know, if you're trying to control every two to three milliseconds, but your response time on your actuator is 10 milliseconds, then you're sending it three commands in the space of time that it takes to complete the first one. And that just makes your whole uh, challenge yeah. harder. Like it, it makes your software much, much more difficult. And so yeah. it could be kind of either one of those things. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. So that's why it's so important that Tesla has uh, varying the best uh, inference chips there are right on board. They can act quickly and they have all the data as much. The more thousands of bots that can get out there, the quicker this thing can learn better. So hard for other, you know, people think that other uh, robot companies will catch up. We'll see what happens. We got uh, a few more big events that happened last night. So the next one is, you know, as we saw the stock rise up, we'll see a slew of institutional analysts raise their price targets. You got Morgan Stanley analyst, Adam Jonas, they're now in the 400s. Okay, they should have just jumped there earlier, but now they're saying 400 again. You know, you got it's, it's funny looking at their excuses rather than, you know, before it was all fundamentals, fundamentals, earnings just not there. Well, well then what, what has changed? So they're maintaining an overnight overweight rating. Um, so they're saying that uh, they've also called it a top pick. And I'll show you that. Near term headwinds to US EV sales. The election brought uh, kind of like helped that, but that the group can add and maintain value by ensuring that it does not cede autonomous leadership to geopolitical rivals. So they're saying that now it's not it's less likely the competitors will win. The US, US election result has extended the ICE's nice trade for a little bit longer. But keep on the lookout for hidden value in the EV ecosystem into the second half of the year. We recommend investors stay nimble and selective given the volatility policy outcomes. So they're blame, they're saying it's all about policy. Okay, um, here's Simon Hale. We he's been on the channel several times now. He works for Wallington, uh, Wallington Altus, their portfolio manager, and their chief strategist is calling for thousand dollars. Believe it. So. You know, th th these guys are are much more in line with the retail community, but you'll see the Wall Street, it's always late. They're always too low and then they'll keep going up. So, you know, yes, Morgan Stanley raised their overnight, this Jim Thorne, who works for Wellington Altus. And um, he's saying, yeah, well, well, Morgan Stanley just raised the 400, but you know, Jim is saying yeah, such a such a bold and courageous move to raise your price target to four hundred dollars <laughs> when the price is. Uh, let me check. Oh wait, four hundred dollars. Yeah, four hundred dollars exactly. So, Cancer Fitzgerald the just price target on Tesla to three sixty five from two fifty five. So yes, they you know they need to catch up. Um, raising from that to due to optimism about robo taxi and self driving tech. Okay, um, neutral on valuation. Advising to wait for a better entry point. Uh, the federal framework, Trump's pol potential policy could benefit Tesla's autonomous vehicle plans. The software update, 13.2, improves reverse driving and auto parking, enhancing robotaxi readiness. FSC expansion. Okay, this is all stuff we already knew. Increasing fleet estimates for, they're increasing the fleet estimates now. New vehicle model, discount rate reduced. Okay, so this is them raising it to... Or, oh, this is another group, CFRA. They're, they've raised to 450 from 375, and they maintain a buy rating. This is Garrett Nelson. Um, optimism about Tesla's future in the area of autonomous driving technology commands a significant market cap of 1.24 already, but though it trades at a premium P of 96. Yeah. At least this one kind of makes sense as far as, you know, if you have a buy on the stock, your price target should be above <laughs> what the actual prices. And yeah, so, yeah. He, you know, he's got a, his price target is 450, which is above the current stock price. Of course, then it makes sense to have a buy. When you have like a buy overweight rating with a price target that's below the current price, that makes no sense. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you see all the time. Like that to me is just so indicative of the one core like ruling principle of wall street and that's show it to me like i'm not going to believe it's going right. to happen until it's actually happened which 
how do you make money if you don't react to things until they already happened? And yeah, it's it's just yeah, silly. And I, and the thing is that they're telling the public that when you know they're acting on different information um, and they're acting ahead of things, so they're you know it's partly just the way that they're trying to spin the narrative yeah. so that they can keep a leg up on other people. And they can't have a three hundred price target when the price is four hundred. And the problem is that what has happened. Like, I know you said that, you know, oh, they need to see it first. But what exactly has happened? I mean, sure. So Just you're the price saying, has moved. Yeah. So here they're saying that, okay, the reason why they're doing this is because of it. Tesla's advancements in autonomous driving. Yes. Which are seen as moving closer to realization. We've been saying this for a long time. The FSD version 13 release showcasing new capabilities such as autonomous parking at on routes and initiating FSD from a park state supports their positive outlook. So that's true. FSD release came out and did it did shock everybody. So that's great. So everybody's following along. This is now something that um, we're watching them all raise their price targets.